الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما نافعا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد كانت لكم أسوة حسنة في إبراهيم والذين معه إذ قالوا لقومهم إنا براء منكم ومما تعبدون من دون الله كفرنا بكم وبدا بيننا وبينكم العداوة والبغضاء أبدا أبدا حتى تؤمنوا بالله وحده إلا قول إبراهيم لأبيه لأستغفرن لك وما أملك لك من الله وما أملك لك من الله من شيء ربنا عليك توكلنا وإليك أنبنا وإليك المصير ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للذين كفروا واغفر لنا ربنا إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم لقد كان لهم لكم فيهم أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر ومن يتول فإن الله هو الغني الحميد عسى الله أن يجعل بينكم وبين الذين عاديتم منهم مودة والله قدير والله غفور رحيم لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم إن الله يحب المقسطين إنما ينهاكم الله عن الذين قاتلوكم في الدين وأخرجوكم من دياركم وظاهروا وظاهروا على إخراجكم أن تولوهم ومن يتولهم فأولئك أئكهم الظالمون. These were the next six ayat of Surah Al-Mumtahina. We covered the first three. Um, if we can recall, Surah Mumtahina was revealed in the context of the incident of Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a. Radiallahu anhu, a Badri Sahabi who uh, slipped. It was a slip by writing to the uh, disbelievers of Mecca who were at war with the Muslims. Basically, you're writing to your enemy, right? And we explained how, you know, what he had in mind. Uh, he wrote um, disclosing the intent of the Prophet. Of what he intended to do at Fathu Makkah. Um, and the Prophet ﷺ wanted to keep this matter uh, a secret till the last moment, and he was going to disclose it. Eventually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not allow this to happen. The message was intercepted on the way, it was returned back to Medina. The Prophet ﷺ called Hatib and said, Oh Hatib, what is this? He explained his situation. And the Prophet ﷺ accepted his uh, excuse and confirmed that he is a sincere companion, he is a Badri companion, and this slip of his, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive and has forgiven. But in the context of this incident, Allah revealed these ayat. And this is a lesson uh, possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused this Sahabi to slip 
so that it could become a lesson for the ummah. This happens a lot. That Sahaba radiallahu anhum, uh, a mistake is committed upon which ayat are revealed and this becomes a lesson for the ummah. So actually that slip becomes a blessing for us. Right? Even the slips of the Sahaba were a blessing for the ummah. Right? And this is how we should uh, um, you know, look at uh, any slips that occur uh, in the Sahaba radiallahu anhum that insha'Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven them because he was pleased with them and we could take lessons from these like these ayat were uh, a lesson for the ummah and the lesson in general the ayat coming up are also related to the same theme that as a believer believers should be careful in their relationships with disbelievers there this, the scholars explain that they try to summarize there are different levels of relationships muslims can have with non-muslims and these ayat are discussing some of them and what is clearly prohibited is what we call wilaya right allah says right in the first verse la tattakhidhu aduwi wa aduwakum awliya what we call muwalat muwalat is um, an intimate friendship it could be an intimate relationship or an intimate friendship with disbelievers this is completely prohibited and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give the example of Ibrahim alayhi salam and the believers in the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam how they did not compromise in this regard. They were very clear about their relationship with those who did not believe in Allah and those who worshipped idols. Right? Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us, the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, that this is an example for you in Ibrahim alayhi salam how to maintain uh, this uh, distance in your intimate relationships, friendships, right? meaning that a true believer cannot be an intimate friend of a disbeliever. Intimate friend meaning that the believer starts uh, accepting the ways of the disbelievers, accepting their beliefs as, uh, you know, okay, right? Accepting their ways, imitating them, participating in their cultural or religious activities this is intimate friendship because there's no way a muslim can have this type of intimate friendship with a disbeliever and not compromise his own religion this will happen for sure and this is why this is prohibited and this is a great tragedy that the ummah is going through now right um, uh, we experience it here too if we are paying attention right if we see those Muslim families, those Muslim children who integrated, assimilated, and became, uh, you know, close friends with non-Muslims, slowly they went away from deen to such an extent that their children don't even know the difference between Islam and, and any other religion. They're all okay, right? It's all fine, right? And everything becomes acceptable, right? And this, this is a result of this type of intimate friendship. It leads to this. In some places, even here also, and in other places, right now there's a, a, a very um, dire situation going on in India, right? The Jamiatul Ulama, uh, uh, the scholars, this, the, the body of scholars there have, you know, now uh, are speaking out publicly to the Muslims, right? Because of this issue of intimate friendships between Muslims and non-Muslims, sometimes females and males, that is leading to thousands of females, our Muslim sisters that have left Islam. They've married into uh, non-Muslim families and they've left Islam. And this is the result of this becoming awliya. Uh, this is, the, this is uh, um, obviously worst case scenario. We never would like this to happen, but uh, this friendship leads to this. Slowly a person starts compromising their religion and eventually they compromise their faith. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns from this. And um, this type of friendship is totally prohibited, regardless of who they may be, all but disbelievers. Meaning, um, it must be clear, right, even though we may be friends in the sense that we are nice to them. So that's the second level. Third level is to be just, to be fair. We must be, as Muslims, we must be fair with everyone. 
Muslims, non-Muslims, not only humans, we must be just with animals. We're not allowed to violate the rights of animals, let alone other human beings. So in this regard, there's no distinction between Muslim and non-Muslim. Justice must be preserved in all circumstances, to the extent that even with the enemy, even with the enemy, the Muslims are not allowed to be unjust, treacherous. There are certain rules of engagement, right, that the Prophet Wasallam taught uh, the Ummah that you cannot commit treachery even with your enemy, right? You cannot cheat them, right? You can use tactics in war, but you cannot use treachery. It's called ghadar. This is because it's injustice. This is not allowed. So that is um, obviously uh, obligated upon us as Muslims to remain just and fair with everyone. And then there's a higher level, which is to be courteous, to show good character, to help, to gift, right? This is called mudarat, right? To, to be nice, right? And this is allowed, not only allowed, but encouraged. The Muslims are encouraged to show this type of hospitality, good character, and to be nice to non-Muslims, just like they're encouraged to be nice with Muslims. With non-Muslims, this type of character is also uh, encouraged. And the, uh, there are, uh, the ayat that are coming up will speak about this. So there's a difference between showing courtesy, showing akhlaq, good character, being nice, um, um, helping if, if that's the case, and just treating a human being with dignity on, and honor. That is uh, commanded, right? That is encouraged, and we are told to maintain these type of relationships even with non-Muslims. But then what is prohibited is going beyond that and becoming intimate friends where we have to compromise our religion. So basically the, the cutoff line is wherever, whatever relationship leads to us compromising our religion, even the slightest bit will be prohibited. Anything uh, within that would be allowed, right? These type of uh, relationships. And this is why we must be very careful. A lot of times people um, engage in these interfaith uh, conversations and discussions and circles. And sometimes it leads to these, uh, these uh, discussions. It leads to having to accept the beliefs of the other parties of the other religion saying that it's fine, right? That there is some common ground that we all share. No, we don't share any common ground in belief, right? Even a single belief that they deny. That we cannot, uh, we cannot be the same in our aqidah, in our belief. Even if it's uh, 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 an aqidah, uh, uh, an, uh, an, uh, um, an aspect of belief, that you know uh, we don't consider to be from the the fundamental aspects of belief but if they differ then we cannot be the same and say that oh we are together in some aspects of our faith right um this is a very dangerous position right when we try to legitimize right other beliefs even though they may differ with us in certain aspects like they don't accept the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam how can we ever um accept uh, a person's faith who rejects the prophethood of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam no matter what they may believe in how many prophets they may believe in how many divine books they may believe in but if they reject the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we cannot be uh, the same in our faith we must express that no, according to us, you are considered disbelievers. If you don't believe in the Quran, you can't be a believer, right? Regardless of what divine books you may believe in of the past, right? So this type of um, clarity, right, a, a believer should adhere to and should not become confused. So this is what um, these ayat are alluding to, and it, it is a very important issue. It is an issue that is. Uh, becoming more and more blurry, right? You have this call now within our own countries, within the Muslim countries now, right? Ittihadul Adiyan, to bring the Abrahamic faiths together, to create one religion, 
unbelief. Is that even possible? It happened in the past in India too, when the, the whole subcontinent was one. There was a time when um, one of the um, Mughal uh, kings, Akbar, right? He ended up um, establishing this new religion called Dina Ilahi, right? And in which he tried to uh, gather all the different faiths that existed there, right? Uh, of, of idol worshiping and Islam and different faiths to um, gather them on one platform, on one faith, that there's only one religion. And this is what we adhere to. Uh, so this is, these are, there are calls being made, right? To bring different religions, the Abrahamic religions, the Jewish faith, the Christian faith, the Islamic faith, on one platform and make it one, like we're all one. How is this possible? How can Islam be one with Judaism and Christianity? Right? Those who reject the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who reject the Quran. No, we can never be. We have to maintain um, our autonomy, right? Or else eventually people will become mixed to the extent that uh, Islam and these other religions, um, uh, there will be no distinction between them. And eventually people will lose iman, lose faith. So this is um, happening right now. So this, these ayat become so much more relevant in our time that we must be very clear about our faith and we must uh, be careful about um, um, engaging in such alliances which cause us to compromise our faith. And this becomes uh, uh, something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is greatly displeased with as he mentions in these ayat. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further goes on to say after um, addressing the incident of Hatib radiallahu anhu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدْ كَانَتْ لَكُمْ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ فِي إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَالَّذِينَ مَعَ For you, O Muslims, O Ummat of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is a beautiful example, Uswatun Hasana. For you, O Ummat of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is a beautiful example in Ibrahim alayhi salam and those that were with him in faith, in Iman. Beautiful example in the sense that how you should be firm on your faith and be clear about dis disassociating yourself from all other faiths. It's very clear. The truth is one. Right? You can't mix it. Right? You can't dilute it. You can't um, you know, um, compromise any aspect of it. It's very clear. The truth is one. وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ Allah makes it very clear. Whoever will uh, seek a religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted from him. Allah says further, إِذْ قَالُوا Regarding Ibrahim السلام, and the Muslims that were with him, إِذْ قَالُوا لِقَوْمِهِمْ Like, for, in them is an example for us, Allah is saying, when, إِذْ قَالُوا لِقَوْمِهِمْ When they said to their people, meaning the idol worshippers of their time, when these people accepted Islam, eventually, initially Ibrahim السلام, was alone when he stood up with Tawheed, and then people started accepting Islam and joined him as Muslims. So when they said to their people at different times, initially Ibrahim السلام, was alone when he said this, and then as Muslims accepted Islam, they also began saying the same thing. When they said to their people, Inna bura'a'u minkum wa mimma ta'buduna min dunillah, we announce our disassociation, like we have nothing to do. Right? We are uh, uh, proclaiming our disavowal from you and from all that you worship other than Allah. We have no relation with you nor with what you worship. Right? We, have, uh, we announce our Dis disavowal. We disown you and whatever you worship, all those idols, meaning we disown you in what in your beliefs. Like we have nothing to do with your beliefs. We are not approving your beliefs at all. We're not substantiating what you people believe in. So we are in Nabura'a Uminkum. We are free from you. We proclaim our disavowal. We are declaring our disavowal from you and whatever. You are worshipping other than Allah. Kafarna bikum. We have disbelieved in you. Meaning we don't believe like the way you believe. Like Allah says in Surah Kafirun. Say to the disbelievers, Ya ayyuhal kafirun, la a'budu ma ta'budun. I do not worship what you worship. Nor do you worship what I worship. Right? That's also 
a, a, a claim of tawheed and disavowal from all aspects of disbelief. And this is why we're told to recite Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun and Qul Hu Allahu Ahad every day, day and night, right? Because on one side in Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun, we are establishing that um, we have nothing to do with the faith of other people, right? And we only worship Allah and will believe in the teachings of Islam. And um, we do not substantiate any other beliefs. And, uh, uh, and ikhlas is to proclaim the oneness of Allah. So in this way, it's bara'at min al-kufr. It's um, free, uh, proclaiming one's disassociation from kufr in qul ya ayyuhal kafirun and establishing one's faith in the oneness of Allah in qul huwa Allahu ahad. So these are coupled together. Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun qul huwa Allah. So when we recite these ayat, like we recite it in the sunnah of Fajr, the sunnah of Maghrib, Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun, Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad, we should think about this. When I'm reading Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun, this is basically what I'm doing. What Ibrahim Alayhi Salam and his people that Allah is giving us an example of, what they said to their people, this is what we are saying in Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun, right? We are claiming, Inna Bura'a Minkum, right? We are. Uh, free and we disassociate ourselves from whatever you people believe in, right? You believe in what you believe, we have a certain belief that we are adhering to. So in Qul Ya Yuhal Kafir, and when we read Qul Huwa Allah, we're establishing our belief. What do we believe in? We believe in Allah as one, right? And we don't associate any partners with Him. So Ibrahim and his people said, and then they said, Kafarna Bikum, we disbelieve in you people and what you believe in. وَبَدَا بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةُ وَالْبَغْضَاءُ أَبَدًا And then they said, between us and between you, adawa, like, um, adawa can be translated as enmity, but enmity seems to be a very strong word. Baghda also is like hatred, and that's a strong word too. Uh, but we know that, we, like we just mentioned, the ayat are coming up which say that you're allowed to be nice to them to deal with them justly as commanded, um, to be courteous, to, to show good character. And a person who has hatred does not show good character, right? A person who has enmity is not courteous. So this is why um, this becomes a little too strong. So we could say, they are saying, between us and between you, al-adawatu wal baghda meaning a contradiction and an aversion, like our beliefs contradict one another. Adawa, right? Like enemies contradict one another. Baghda, hatred, in other words, aversion. Like there's no way I can entertain your beliefs. It's not possible, right? I, by being a Muslim, I will always be averse and opposed to your faith, right? There's no way I can accommodate and entertain your beliefs as a Muslim because once I do that, I compromise my, compromise my own beliefs. Once I accept the, the legality of your faith, I've compromised my own. And this is something I cannot do. And between us and between you, contradiction and aversion has become apparent forever. Until when? Until you believe in Allah alone. Once you accept Islam sincerely, then we will be brothers in faith then this aversion and contradiction will not, no longer remain. Until then, we are contradictory to one another in our faith and we are averse to one another. There's no way we can stand on the same platform in regards to our beliefs. إِلَّا قَوْلَ Ibrahim, Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala excludes one incident because he's giving us an example of Ibrahim alayhi salam and the Muslims with him. In other words, we should follow their example and be very clear of our distancing from all other beliefs, right? We should be very clear on this and that we will not compromise in any way our faith in our relation with anyone else. إِلَّا قَوْلَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لِأَبِيهِ Except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says one exclusion, meaning that in this regard, Ibrahim alayhi salam, there is no example for you in, in this incident. Meaning this is not an example for you. Uh, this is a one way that some people have explained this verse, meaning what Ibrahim salam did in, in the upcoming uh, ayah, this you should not do. But then other scholars say that no, what Ibrahim salam did, he did what he did 
assuming that his father had accepted Iman or he did it before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited him from doing so. Right? And it is the incident of Ibrahim salam seeking forgiveness for his father. In other words, this is not allowed for this ummah. If someone's close friend, family member is not a Muslim, we are not allowed to seek forgiveness for them. Yes, we can seek their guidance, but not forgiveness. We can ask Allah to guide them, but not forgive them. So this is why another interpretation of this ayah is that Ibrahim was actually seeking guidance for his father in the form of seeking forgiveness. So that's another meaning of seeking forgiveness. So either uh, the exclusion uh, is an apparent exclusion and actually it's not something that is prohibited, meaning Ibrahim was actually seeking guidance by seeking forgiveness for his father and that is allowed for us. Or if he was seeking forgiveness for his father, he was doing it at a time when he was not prohibited from doing so. But now we are prohibited. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it very clearly in Surah At-Tawbah. It is not befitting and allowed for the Prophet وسلم, or the believers to seek forgiveness for the disbelievers. So this is prohibited. Ibrahim salam did so and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in that aspect, he is, that is not an example for you, O Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa you cannot seek forgiveness. إِلَّا قَوْلَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لِأَبِيهِ لَأَسْتَغْفِرَنَّ لَكَ Except for the statement of Ibrahim salam for his father, I will surely seek forgiveness for you. وَمَا أَمْلِكُ لَكَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ And I do not uh, own like I do not possess for you from Allah anything. Meaning I cannot confirm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you and save you from the hellfire. I can only ask Allah. Like I will seek forgiveness for you from Allah, but I don't have any authority over Allah that he will accept this istighfar forgiveness for sure and save you from the hellfire. That I cannot guarantee. So this is what Ibrahim salam said and Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that in this regard, Ibrahim salam is not an example for you, meaning you are not allowed to seek forgiveness. Or if he was seeking guidance, then he would be an example, meaning that you can seek guidance like Ibrahim salam did, but at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will decide. Guidance is in his hands. We cannot guide anyone on our own. Then Ibrahim a.s. further, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, after um, uh, proclaiming his disavowal and disassociation from the disbelievers and their idol worshipping, he made this dua, Rabbana alayka tawakkalna, or our Lord, it is upon you we put our trust, we trust in you. Wa ilayka anabna, and to you do we return, or do we turn. وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ And to you is the final return. So to you do we turn in repentance. إِلَيْكَ أَنَبْنَا وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ And to you is the final return in the next life. رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْنَا فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا O our Lord, do not make us a, a, a tribulation for those who have disbelieved. In other words, do not make us such that because of our aversion to the disbelievers don't make don't allow them to commit aggression against us right? because we are not compromising our faith obviously there might be some hatred from the other side that why are these people not accepting what we believe why do they uh, um, express their contradiction to us their aversion to our faith and this might lead to aggression, right? Islamophobia is real, right? That uh, people don't like it when Muslims adhere to their faith. Why aren't they assimilating? Why do not they not accept our way of life? Sometimes this leads to aggression. It's intolerance, obviously, right? People cannot tolerate, uh, you know, other human beings that may be different from them. So that leads to sometimes aggression. So Ibrahim a.s. is teaching us also in his dua, and this also becomes a, a, a something that we should adhere to and we should pray for. Ibrahim is saying that because, uh, oh Allah, because we have 
made this clear to the disbelievers, it's possible that they may show aggression against us. So Allah protect us from such aggression. رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَنَّا فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Oh Allah, do not make us a tribulation for the disbelievers. Tribula tribulation means that do not uh, make us so weak and incapable that the disbelievers are capable of oppressing us. Then we become a fitna for them. We become a fitna in the sense that uh, they, they have the upper hand over us and they abuse us, they uh, oppress us, and they do injustice to us. So in this way, we become a fitna for them, meaning that because they have the upper hand, they continue to show aggression and commit these crimes, right? So, and that takes them further away from Islam. So it's like the Muslims become a fitna for the disbelievers due to their own weakness. So do not make us so weak and incapable that they show aggression against us. Rabbana la taj'alna fitnatan lil-ladheena kafaru. Oh Allah, do not make us a tribulation and so weak uh, uh, for the disbelievers that they uh, oppress us and show aggression against us. Waghfir lana Rabbana. And oh Allah, forgive us for any mistakes, for any um, apparent compromise that we may have made, apparent affiliation that may have uh, displeased you, O oh Allah, right? Because in this regard, sometimes uh, we cross the limits in our affiliation with disbelievers. So we're seeking forgiveness from Allah. O oh Allah, forgive us. You are the Almighty. You are the All Wise. فيهم أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر. Then Allah سبحانه وتعالى says, uh, in summarizing once again the example of Ibrahim عليه السلام. Allah says, surely indeed for you, O Ummah of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, and Ibrahim عليه السلام and the Muslims of his time is a beautiful example. For who? For the one who sincerely hopes in Allah and believes in Him. لمن كان يرجو الله the one who has sound faith in Allah, وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ And the last day, for him, they are an example. But for those people who truly don't believe in Allah, then they won't mind, right? Building these friendships with disbelievers, compromising their religion. Uh, they won't mind becoming intimate in their affiliations with disbelievers because they truly don't believe in Allah in يَوْمُ الْآخِرِ This is what Allah says, that for the one who hopes in Allah, meeting Allah, and the one who believes in the day of judgment, the last day. This person will be careful in his relationships. This person will not compromise his deen. وَمَن يَتَوَلَّ Allah says, and the one who turns away from this command, the one who doesn't care, the one who starts associating, emulating, imitating, integrating, right, eventually, right, and accepting, the beliefs of other religions. Allah says, whoever turns away, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْغَنِيُّ الْحَمِيدُ Then indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of anyone. Allah is saying this to us for our own good, so that we don't uh, go astray. Or else, if someone goes astray and he adopts that path of deviance, Allah says, هُوَ الْغَنِيُّ Allah is independent. It's not like he needs anyone. Hamid, He is... Uh, perfect in all of his traits and therefore he is worthy of all praise he is worthy of all praise al hamid and therefore the um deviance of, uh, of of humans does not harm him and nor does he need humans to worship him and this is why allah is saying don't uh, go towards other beliefs and believe only in allah not like he needs us to worship him he is uh, perfect in every way and therefore he doesn't need the worship of others to um, enhance his perfection. Allah says he is a hamid. He is worthy of all praise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, عَسَى اللَّهُ أَنْ يَجْعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَ الَّذِينَ عَادَيْتُمْ مِّنْهُمْ مَوَدَّةِ وَاللَّهُ قَدِيرٌ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّعِيمٌ And perhaps because the Sahaba radiallahu anhu when these ayat were revealed obviously uh, many of the Sahaba, especially the Muhajirun who had migrated, they obviously were uh, uh, people of belief, but many of their family members were still disbelievers in Mecca at this time, right? At Fatu Mecca, before Fatu Mecca, even though there was a sulh, but many of their family members who were still in Mecca, tribes, relatives, they were still disbelievers, mushrikun. 
and obviously these ayat, uh, you know, emphasize the fact that they cannot have any uh, friendship relationships with them. So this must have been very difficult, right? When a person accepts Islam, sometimes, a lot of times, most of the times, they have to leave their family who has not accepted Islam, and it's it's not easy, right? Uh, most of us, all of us, some of us, uh, maybe, but most of us have not experienced this, right? Because of our Islam, to leave our families right uh, for our families to become enemies right but those who accept islam uh, for them this is a great struggle the sahaba radiallahu also experienced this right their close family sometimes their fathers their mothers their brothers and sisters they became enemies to them so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is um, now consoling the sahaba radiallahu who might be experiencing this you know difficulty this challenge Right, that they have to be um, averse and and they they cannot have any intimate friendship relationships with such individuals. Right, they have to maintain their uh, you know autonomy and uh, disassociate themselves from such family members. But at the same time, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is now comforting these Sahaba and consoling them and saying that this aversion or this detachment from such family members. Who knows, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will only make it for a short period of time. And this is what actually happened. Allah says, عَسَى اللَّهُ أَن يَجْعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَ الَّذِينَ عَادَيْتُمْ مِنْهُمْ مَوَدَّةً Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Allah uses asa for himself, that means this is certain. Allah will surely do this. So with certainty, Allah will make between you and those who you are contradicting or those who you are averse to who, who you are separated from وَبَيْنَ الَّذِينَ عَادَيْتُمْ those be, between you and those that you have enmity between مِنْهُمْ مَوَدَّةً from amongst them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will certainly put love between you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put between you and those who you are uh, detached from from amongst the disbelievers what will he put between you mawadda love and this is what happened when the sahaba prophet sallallahu went for fath makkah and besides those who were killed before this incident um, the majority of the people of makkah accepted islam so all those family members that were disbelievers till now and that the muslims who had migrated had no connection with now became family once again because they all accepted Islam. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that this is possible. If you are firm on your faith, your firmness may cause these individuals come, to come into Islam. Right? Uh, people say that, no, we need to you know, uh, you know, acknowledge their faith and we need to be uh, accommodating to them. And they say, we're doing this so that, that we can bring them closer to Islam. No, they won't come closer to Islam. If you're substantiating their faith, why do they need to accept Islam then? If you're accommodating their beliefs, why would they need to switch over to your beliefs? You're just giving them justification to be who they are. Instead of saying that, no, this matter is very clear, that uh, you, know, you people are disbelievers. There's only one truth. And if you disbelieve in the Quran, you've disbelieved in Allah. Right? You can't claim to be believers in Allah and the messengers if you disbelieve in the Prophet ﷺ. And therefore, um, there's no compromise in this. Ho possibly they may realize that yes, like you know, if we don't accept the last messenger and the last message, how can we be true believers? And maybe Allah will bring them to Islam because of our firmness, because we are not ready to compromise. We've seen what happens when other religions compromise their faith. Right? Eventually they lose their followers. Right, this is what's happening now in the other faiths, in Christianity uh, 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 mostly, and in other faiths too. When they start compromising their teachings, they start watering down their religion. Eventually, the people of that faith they realize that you know this faith is not true. If it was true, we wouldn't be compromising all of our teachings. We wouldn't be going against them, right? We wouldn't be every now and then changing them just to accommodate the norm, right? And therefore. Um, this type of watering down actually does an injustice to deen, does a disservice to the religion. It's not for the service of religion. People try to make this excuse. Oh, we need to 
uh, accommodate people and you know uh, what they want right to bring them closer to Islam right that's a, a, a totally wrong approach it's actually impermissible to do that it's not even allowed right the scholars make this clear that if to accommodate people and to bring them closer to Islam if a person has to break any command of Allah this is not permissible right like any type of da'wah that results in sacrificing and compromising the deen that da'wah is not allowed it's any da'wah towards Islam must be without comprom compromising any command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any teaching of the Prophet sallallahu so this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying with certainty Allah will put love between you right if you remain firm they will, Allah will bring them to you on your side Wallahu qadir Allah is capable of doing this Wallahu ghafoorur rahim and Allah is all forgiving all merciful for any wrongdoings that may have been committed in the past we left out two, two ayat these are the two ayat that uh, differentiate between the two types of disbelievers those who are at war with Muslims right and clearly enemies of Islam and Muslim and those who Muslims are living with uh, you know in harmony right so basically when Muslims are living with non-Muslims as citizens in a multi-faith multicultural society in a democratic society um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it is not prohibited for Muslims to be nice and show good character to non-Muslims uh, so in the upcoming two verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this uh, distinction and um, this allowance and prohibition also inshallah we'll continue next week Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a true understanding of these ayat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us firm on our faith. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from uh, such assimilation, integration that makes us uh, compromise our teachings and our deen. Right? Allah give us that strength. Sometimes it's uh, guidance, actually all the time, it's guidance from Allah. If Allah removes his guidance, then some uh, a lot of times people don't even realize they have gone astray. They have compromised their deen. They actually try to justify what they are doing. And a person doesn't even realize how far they're gone. Uh, so it is in the hands of Allah, Hidayah, guidance. We ask Allah for guidance. Oh Allah, guide our hearts and protect our hearts from misguidance. And protect us from doing anything that displeases Allah. A lot of times even we are confused about situations. And if Allah doesn't assist us, we may end up falling into uh, something that displeases Allah. So we should continuously seek forgiveness also, right? And um, Allah give us the tawfiq. Yeah, inshallah, we were talking about it. Next week we'll have the daras, inshallah, after asr. Gets kind of late after Maghrib. Any objection? No, we can't change the day. But because Maghrib is kind of getting late, so for the summer months after Salatul Asr, I think it's a good time too, in the sense that um, after Asr, we can dedicate that time, stay in the masjid, right? Asr to Maghrib, it's Jumu'ah. Uh, we could have some daras and then spend the rest of the time in dua, dhikr. So it's a good time to be in the masjid, inshallah, after asr. Tayyib, inshallah. Uh, they announced it too. Uh, the other program is after asr too. So from next week, inshallah, our daras will be after asr. Allah give us the tawfiq. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, subhanakallah. Alhamdulillah, 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 alhamdulillah,